We're going to talk about six things I wish I knew before I lost the weight, like before I lost 60 pounds the first time. (laughs) You can see how this is going to go. Welcome to the Creative Life in Motion podcast, where we don't wait until we reach our goals to be happy. We fall in love with who we are being on the way. And I'm your host, Karen, and soon to be, if not already, virtual BFF. By the end of this episode, you're going to think of weight loss and the effects of it in a very different way, maybe a way that you've never even imagined. If you are in the middle of a weight loss journey, maybe just starting out, or maybe you're in the wild world of weight loss maintenance, you're in really good company. I know what it's like to be all three. In fact, a lot of us do feel the same way, I think. The weight loss industry is worth somewhere around $3.4 billion, and that's just in the U.S. alone. I'm up here in Canada. I don't know. It's probably the same up here, too, from what I see. 80% of adults say that they could be healthier. I mean, have you ever had a conversation with someone where you tell them that, you know, they're looking great? And then there's the yeah, but, right? The yeah, but. We have a case of the yeah, but. It's hard to just take a compliment. You could say, you're looking so good today. And yeah, but I need to lose 10 pounds before fill in the blank. It's another common thing that happens is that when you do lose weight, everybody is just like, all over you saying that you look so great and what are you doing? Sometimes that can be a little overwhelming and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this episode. I wrote a book about it. Be weightless, like your body, love yourself. I have a one woman show that I'm taking on the road very soon called My Body is My Home, all about body image. Even though I advocate for uh, fitness at every size, I too gravitate to anything that says it can help me lose weight. It's like it's a program that will not go away. If it has a promise of helping me lose weight, I look twice. I look at it. I read it. How does that happen where it's so programmed in? And how do you go from being like really content with who you are and where your journey is? to be an obsessed because that can easily happen too. This episode was inspired by the book I wrote in 2021, had it written and self-published in 90 days. I've often wondered if writing a book is something that you've had on your bucket list because I could totally do a playlist. Like what would that be like if you could have your own nonfiction book written and published within 90 days, or maybe you don't want to publish it, but maybe it's something that you want to maybe pass on to future generations. I don't know, especially if you're in the generation where we're like the Gen Xers and we have so much to share. It's great that we're all sharing on YouTube, but what what if we could get something into the hands of more people for a longer amount of time? And we're sharing all of our wisdom. Isn't that cool? Like when I first wrote this book, I'm like, I need to get my handbook out to all the future generations of women out there to understand how to love their bodies and and what dieting and societal expectations of a changing, fluctuating, fluctuating body can feel like. Anyways, let's move on to the topic. And if if you're interested in that, it only takes like one person to say, heck yeah, do a playlist, comment below, and I'll get moving on that this, this fall for sure. Back to our topic. When I lost the weight, nobody was more shocked than me. Okay. I was super happy and content with where, where I was in life. I had accepted myself for who I was. Although I did you know, abuse my body in many different ways. I didn't know I was abusing it. I was just young and having fun. I I just accepted myself and my life for what it was because I did not understand that there might have been something else out there for me. 
if you've been here a while, you know my story of I began walking because I was adulting. I had to adult and walk my son to school. And that's where my fitness journey started. And so nobody was more shocked than I was to be looking at myself 65 pounds leaner and a lot leaner in my brain too, right? A lot of things that I sorted out that I didn't even realize I needed to. That was the catalyst to so much more, but it it didn't get better right away. Like everybody thinks that that's like a happy ever after, you know, chubby girl loses weight and her life is perfect after. And that's not always how it goes. And so I want to share with you the things that I wish I knew that might have made my life a little bit easier, or maybe they wouldn't. Maybe I wouldn't have taken the advice. I don't know. But these are things that I wish I would have known and acted on before I lost the weight. I wish I knew that the closer that I got to my ideal body weight, that the scale would go up and not get down. And that that didn't mean that I was getting fat again. I had grown so addicted to seeing that number go down on the scale. Every week, I'm celebrating. My mom's celebrating. People are telling me how great I look. Everybody is celebrating this loss. And so when the scale stopped moving, And actually started fluctuating with my monthly cycle, with a little too much salt, water retention. I started panicking. You know, I thought that I was doing something wrong. Instead of actually celebrating the fact that, oh my gosh, I'm actually at my leanest body weight. I'm at my ideal healthiest body weight. I decided to diet down and exercise more. Because I must be doing something wrong because the scale is going up. I didn't understand that it doesn't continue to go down, you know, because I was in an unhealthy BMI. And that was because mainly of my endomorph body type. It's very common. But when you go in and you measure, you know, what's my healthy and you put your BMI and you're still in the obese category and you're like, oh, well, I've lost all this weight. I'm in single digit clothes, but the BMI says I'm still obese. So I got locked into that and it that didn't turn out too good for me, which leads me to this next one is that I wish I would have kept more in between clothes. I didn't realize that once I got to my lowest weight, my body would want to put 10 pounds back on because that was actually my ideal weight. And so when I got down to my lowest weight, I got rid of all of my bigger clothes and only kept the lowest weight and the lowest size clothes. So when I did have those monthly fluctuations, what would happen is the clothes would be really tight. And nobody feels lean when their clothes are tight. Then I would have thoughts that, again, same thing as a scale, I'm doing this wrong. I didn't think that I deserved to buy any clothes that were bigger than the lowest one. In fact, I would rather buy something that is a lower size to get into. And I I wish I didn't do that. I wish I would have kept some of my better outfits that I really liked and that made me feel comfortable on the days that maybe I wasn't, you know, feeling my best in my body, which it's going to happen. It's It happens no matter what age we are. We have days where we feel great in our bodies and we have days when we don't. I, I think that that's human, but I think that we're the only ones that are really looking at that though. So The way you talk to yourself matters. Wish I knew how much I would be hit on and that that type of validation was very addicting. And it later turned into fear. I went from being this safe space to being a threatening person. Like my best friends didn't trust me with their partners anymore because I had changed and I was flirtatious. But 
I hadn't changed. I was perhaps more confident, but I was the same happy, jolly person when I was fat. So I didn't understand why the happy and the jolly and the trustworthy transformed into flirtatious and dangerous. That was something that I wasn't prepared for other people's reaction to my change. I wish I knew that it wouldn't make me happier until I did the inner work. I had nights where I would be falling asleep at night, you know, when I was 14, 15, just wondering what it would be like to be in a lean body, you know, and I would actually think that I would give anything just to experience it for one day. And there I was with it, with my leanest body. I was living it. I was in my late 20s by the time I actually experienced it. But all the same problems and baggage were with me. I had to work on my inner self before I could really truly identify love for my body. And even then, it still works sometimes. So there's that. I wish I knew that the skin, the excess skin that you have on your body after you lose weight, would take a while to snap back and it would actually create things like fat rolls that weren't there and I could actually stretch it out and I felt like I was looking in the mirror at just like a slightly smaller fat girl because I didn't see what I expected to see from you know magazine before and afters why didn't I look like the other afters thought something was still wrong with me. I still didn't measure up. I think this is the biggest one here. This might have helped me avoid so much more like angst is if I would have learned how to maintain my weight before I learned how to diet. When I first started losing weight, I didn't really make very much changes. I had just added activity and that kind of was the catalyst to paying attention to what I was eating more. And actually, my appetite just naturally went down. I started like not eating till I was full, but just eating till I was satisfied. I started saying no to dessert, just very small changes. It didn't happen all at once. Actually, I did write about it in the book. So when the audio book is ready, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. It's, it's almost there. But it was very small changes. And I think at that point, I think I was learning how to maintain my healthy lifestyle. And it wasn't until I started like looking for how do I keep losing weight when that I started to find out about like strength training and building muscle and eating protein and dieting. And all of the diet industry was like wide open to me. It was a concept I had never been interested in before until I had a taste of, oh my gosh, I can actually be living in a lean, healthy body. I I want more and I never want this to leave. I never, ever want to go back. So it became interesting to me. I'm kind of the type of person, I'm all or nothing. Diets are really great tools, but they're not forever tools right? Diets are not sustainable lifestyle changes. Learning what your maintenance calories are and what makes you feel your healthiest is going to get you further faster. Make sure that you know why you're doing it and that you have an exit strategy that's not going to backfire. I think that it's necessary to talk about this, especially because We talk about healthy aging. We talk about weight loss. We talk about walking for weight loss. And I think it's important to know that there is an after the weight loss and there is a during the weight loss. And I encourage you to love your body between the ups and downs of weight loss because a lot of times when it goes down, it goes back up again. And you're just as worthy of love when it goes back up again as when it goes down, that was probably a harder lesson for me to learn than actually losing weight. Losing weight is actually pretty freaking easy. 
there's a recipe you you know for most people if if you like really get rigid on a diet or whatever you're gonna lose weight especially if you haven't done it before um but it's it's learning how to love your body in between the ups and downs through the decades and just everyday lifestyle choices of you know putting good things in your body making sure that you move those are some of the things that I wish I would have learned a little bit easier but I, I I'm okay with the fact that I didn't maybe some of it will be helpful to you I say that I'm okay with the fact that I didn't because I can't undo what's done. So that's part of the journey is forgiving yourself for things that you might do differently if you had another chance. I also understand that for for someone out there, you're going to benefit from my failures if I share them with you. And maybe you're going through the same thing right now and all of this is doing is helping you feel like you're you're not alone. That's why I'm here. You're never alone. What do you say? We pull a card from the sacred self-care deck. We haven't done this in a while. Hey, you know what? Okay. I also want to invite you all the links in the descriptions below. One of the best friends you can have for your health journey is walking. I call it your best friend because it's something that you can take anywhere. doesn't cost a dime to go for a walk. And it's it's something that will continue to serve you through your life as a base of fitness. I'm a firm believer that going for a daily walk in the outside fresh air is what will keep you young and healthy through everything, both physically and mentally. And... We need that. So, okay. So if you're new here and we've never pulled a card together before, know that this is from the Sacred Self-Care deck. Oh, where's my glasses? Oh, I can't believe. Did I just do that? Like that was not planned. Here we go. There we are. Okay. This card is meant for you to see. It'll give us a little self-care activity to do this week. Alone time. So what are the some of the ways that you can take alone time? I know. You can go for a walk alone. Take your earbuds out. Listen to silence. Listen to your thoughts. I know. It can be scary to listen to thoughts. So your mantra for the week is, I make time to focus on myself. Making time for yourself a lot of times can be selfish until we actually realize that it's selfless. When you make time to clear your thoughts and compose yourself, everybody else gets to benefit from that. So for your journal prompt, how does having alone time make you feel? For me, I mean, the first word that comes about is, Alone time makes me feel energized. Unless I have too much of it, then I get kind of lonely. What emotions and memories come up for you when you're alone? For me lately, I've been thinking a lot. Like I actually, I've been working on some of my writing for my next book. It's coming out. I don't know, I'll be looking for beta readers in the fall. But I've been reflecting a lot on why I'm so comfortable alone. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I was an outcast. I did spend a lot of time alone. We moved around a lot. I was always the new kid. And then being the new kid, you're like infused into these classrooms where these kids were friends forever. And so... At first, you're like the interesting one, and then everybody wants to be your friend, and then nobody wants to be your friend. I would sit in my room. I would play Barbies. Jeez, I was like 14 years old, still playing Barbies, imagining that my life could be better. And I was reading Judy Bloom books. I loved her books. I would like get right into her books and I felt like the characters. 
And so in my alone time as a young person, I became comfortable with being alone. What was started out as lonely became a safe space and a space where I wasn't being bullied, a space where I could still be my childlike self and not be judged, and a space where I could imagine and go away and really be embraced in a story, feel seen. Maybe that's why I became a writer, because I I had a little bit of that when I was young, and it was very helpful for me. I mean, I didn't know Judy Bloom, but those years that I spent huddled up with her books felt seen. Hopefully that that's where you feel right now, is you feel seen, you feel loved. I'm really grateful that you spend this time with me. I don't take it lightly. I, I know how time is such a precious gift. I'll have all the links to all tools to, to help you on your health journey, your walking journey, ways to work with me. They're all in the description down below. And until next time, you have a great week. Bye for now.